Hello and welcome back to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg and I am here today because something very exciting has happened. We have the first major book award news of 2022. And of course, the second I started filming this, the heaters went wild. So I apologize if you have to listen to a lot of clicking in the background. We're just going to go with it. The day I am announcing this is International Women's Day. And in celebration of that, the Women's Prize announced its long list for 2022. Really exciting news. And thank you for being a friend and happy International Women's Day. I have taken a quick look at the list. I didn't go much further to look at any of the descriptions or anything like that because some of these books are going to be new to me and I want to kind of look at the premises of these books and react in real time. I love a prize list because to me it's a way of discovering new books, maybe a way of rethinking books that you had considered and decided not to read before. And of course it's a way of celebrating your favorites, things that you really want to support and see succeed and win. It's a really exciting thing. This seems like a solid list. There are three big omissions, and I'll get to those at the end after we've talked about all of the books that made the long list. Real quick notes about this. I have my laptop here to reference so I don't mess anything up. On this long list, there are five British authors, six Americans, two New Zealanders, one Turkish-British writer, one American-Canadian, and one Trinidadian writer. So this is a very diverse group of writers and books, which is something that the Women's Prize really likes to celebrate, so that's not all that surprising. There are also five, count them, five debut novels, some of which stole a slot from established authors that are really popular. So, but again, we'll get to omissions or snubs, if you want to call them that, a little bit later on in the video. This seems like a solid bunch of books, but again, I'm kind of unfamiliar with some of them, which is exciting. So I am going to look at the descriptions of these books on the Women's Prize website. I'll put a link to that in the description box down below. I'll put reactions to the winner of this prize from last year and maybe the long list from last year as well, if you'd like to check that out. But let's dive in because there are 16 books to talk about here. The first long-listed title is Build Your House Around My Body by Violet Cooper Smith. And the description, which is not long, is two young Vietnamese women go missing decades apart. Both are fearless, both are lost, and both will have their revenge. 1986, the teenage daughter of a wealthy Vietnamese family gets lost in an abandoned rubber plantation while fleeing her angry father and is forever changed by the experience. 2011, 25 years later, a young, unhappy Vietnamese-American disappears from her new home in Saigon without a trace. The fates of both women are inescapably linked, bound together by past generations, by ghosts and ancestors, by the history of possessed bodies and possessed lands. Violet Cooper Smith's heart-pounding fever dream of a novel hurdles through the ghostly secrets of Vietnamese history to create an immersive, playful, utterly unforgettable debut. So this is one of the debut novels. It is one of the ones that I had not heard of, and... That description really catches my interest. So I'm going to leave this tab open so I can see if this book is available either at my library or in any of my subscription apps because I am very interested in reading that. I'm not going to do a hardcore prediction for what is going to make the shortlist from this. I'm just, I will make a couple of wild speculations and we're really early. This is only the first long list of title that I'm looking at, but it seems to me from that description that this book could be going places. The next one is Careless by Kirsty Capes. The description is, Sometimes it's easy to fall between the cracks. At 3 or 4 p.m. on a hot, sticky day in June, Bess finds out she's pregnant. She could tell her social worker Henry, but he's useless. She could, should tell her foster mother Lisa, but she won't understand. She really ought to tell Boy, but she hasn't spoken to him in weeks. Best knows more than anyone that love does not come without conditions, but this is not a love story. That also sounds really interesting and possibly a little heartbreaking. I am going to leave this tab open as well because I would like to search that book out. Part of me wonders how it will land having been a foster father because so much of fiction is a little negative toward foster parents. And I, I get it. I understand there are bad foster parents out there, but, you know, I... I do get a little upset when the default is to make a foster parent bad. But I understand as well that foster children go through a lot. And this sounds like a really interesting way of getting in one's head. So without knowing anything about the author or anything else about the book, I am very interested in reading that. 
I am not going to go all in and say it probably has really good shot at getting into the shortlist. Although I'm looking at this in the blurb on the cover, astounding, heartbreaking, but hopeful is from Pandora Sykes, who I believe is the chair of the jury for the Women's Prize this year. So there's probably not a very big coincidence for you. It probably is a good contender to get onto the shortlist, but we'll see. I want to get a little further into the list before committing myself. The next one is Creatures of Passage by Moroa Yejide. Nephthys Kinwell is a taxi driver of sorts in Washington, D.C., ferrying ill-fated passengers in a haunted car, a 1967 Plymouth Belvedere with a ghost in the trunk. Interesting. Endless rides and alcohol help her manage her grief over the death of her twin brother, Osiris, who was murdered and dumped in the Anacostia River. Unknown to Nephthys when the novel opens in 1977, her estranged great-nephew, nephew 10-year-old Dash, is finding himself drawn to the banks of that very same river. It is here that Dash, reeling from having witnessed an act of molestation at his school, but still questioning what and who he saw, has charmed conversations with a mysterious figure he calls the Riverman, and who somehow appears each time he goes there. When Dash arrives unexpectedly at Nephthys' door one day bearing a cryptic note about his unusual conversations with the Riverman, Nephthys must face both the family she abandoned and what frightens her most when she looks in the mirror. Creatures of Passage beautifully threads together the stories of Nephthys, Dash, and others both living and dead. Moroa Yejide's deeply captivating novel shows us an unseen Washington filled with otherworldly landscapes, flawed superhumans, and reluctant ghosts, and brings together a community intent on saving one young boy in order to reclaim themselves. It sounds really interesting. I can see why this is on the long list. Based on the description, this is an, another one. The first three have been books that I was unfamiliar with. Um, I am going to say I'm going to wait and see what reaction from other people is on this book because that seems like a lot. And it all sounds interesting, but it could kind of go off the rails a little bit. I'm also always hesitant of anything that really involves ghosts. So... I'm going to close this tab and wait for a little bit of feedback. And if you have read Creatures of Passage, please let me know what you thought in the comment section down below. Because it does sound interesting, but I'm going to wait for more. Possibly the short list or just reactions from other people to this list and see what they thought about it when they read it. Uh, it sounds interesting. There's a lot of potential for that to be a very good book. The next title on this list is another one I was unfamiliar with. So I'm four for four. Apparently, I need to pay better attention to new release lists. Anyway, it's Flamingo by Rachel Elliott, and here is the description. First, there were flamingos, and then there were two families, Sherry and Leslie and their daughters, Ray and Pauline, and Eve and her son, Daniel. Sherry loves her husband, Leslie. She also loves Eve. It couldn't have been a happier summer, but then Eve left and everything went gray. Now Daniel is all grown up and broken, and when he turns up at Sherry's door, it's almost as if they've all come home again. But there's still one missing. Where is Eve, and what exactly is her story? Flamingo is a novel about the power of love, welcome, and acceptance. It's a celebration of kindness, of tenderness. Set in 2018 and the 80s, it's a song for the brokenhearted and for the big-hearted, and is ultimately a novel grown from gratitude and a book full of wild hope. All right, being honest, for the first half of that description, I was thinking, I don't know if I'm interested in this. <laughs> and then it really won me back at the end, talking about how it's a celebration of kindness and tenderness, everything about it being grown from gratitude and a book full of wild hope. That feels like things that I'm gravitating to right now, for obvious reasons. And it's one of the things that I really liked about the TV show Pose, which I just finished. And I loved that it is ultimately about trying to be a good person and doing good things in, in the world. So that kind of turned it around. I don't know that I'm going to seek it out immediately. I do want a little bit of feedback just because I wasn't sure about the... Pre I'm going to leave this tab open and I'll look around. But if you have read Flamingo, please let me know what you thought of it in the comment section down below. Because it sounds interesting, but I am hesitating just a little bit. Especially since there are so many more titles <laughs> to go. The next one is very familiar to me. And it's something that I actually got from the library and wasn't able to read, so I had to return it and get back on the wait list. It's The Great Circle by Maggie Shipstead. And of course, I'm really familiar with this book because it had a run at the Booker Prize last year. It was a shortlisted title for that. I'll put a reaction video down below to the shortlist for the Booker Prize if you'd like more about this book. I really want to read it. I just haven't gotten around to it yet. I've heard a lot of really great things about it. I've heard some negative, but a lot of really great things as well. 
And one of the fun things about it is that it's at least partially set in Missoula, Montana, which is where I live. And that's just kind of fun. From her days as a wild child in Prohibition America to the blitz and glitz of wartime London, from the rugged shores of New Zealand to a lonely ice shelf in Antarctica, Marion Graves is driven by a need for freedom and danger. Determined to live an independent life, she resists the pull of her childhood sweetheart and burns her way through a suite of glamorous lovers, but it's an obsession with flight that consumes her most. Now, as she is about to fulfill her greatest ambition to circumnavigate the globe from pole to pole, Marion crash lands in a perilous wilderness of ice. Over half a century later, troubled film star Hadley Baxter is drawn inexorably to play the enigmatic pilot on screen. It is a role that will lead her to an unexpected discovery, throwing fresh and spellbinding light on the story of the unknowable Marion Graves. Still sounds very interesting to me. The funny thing about the timeline for the women's prize compared to other prizes is that this feels so much like a book from last year, and here it is because it already had the run at the Booker Prize. It feels like something that probably should have already been eligible for the Women's Prize, but clearly was not. So timing works in weird ways with all book awards, but sometimes with the Women's Prize in particular. So fun twist of fate. I think this probably has a good shot at making the shortlist. If the Women's Prize jury is a little bit concerned about the Booker having already made its mark on the Great Circle, maybe they won't want to advance it and favor some of the lesser-known authors on the list. But I think it certainly has a good shot at getting there, and this is definitely a book that I would like to read for myself. The next one is Remote Sympathy by Catherine Chigi, another book I had not heard of. Moving away from their lovely apartment in Munich isn't nearly as wrenching an experience for Frau Greta Hahn as she had feared. Their new home is even lovelier than the one they left behind, and life in Buchenwald would appear to be idyllic. Living just beyond the forest that surrounds them is the looming presence of a work camp. Frau Hahn's husband, SS Sturm... I am not going to try to pronounce that word, because clearly I didn't prepare. Uh, Dietrich Hahn has been assigned as the camp's administrator. This is taking a dark turn. When Frau Hahn's poor health leads her to into an unlikely and poignant friendship with one of Buchenwald's prisoners, Dr. Leonard Weber. Her naive ignorance about what is going on so nearby is challenged. A decade earlier, Dr. Weber had invented a machine believed that its subtle resonance might cure cancer. But does it really work? One way or another, it might save a life. A tour de force about the evils of obliviousness. Very timely. <laughs> uh, remote sympathy compels us to a question about our continuing and willful ability to look the other way in a world that is enthralled to the idea that everything, even facts and morals, is relative. I'm going to wait for feedback on that book from other people. So if you have thoughts about it, please let me know in the comment section down below. If you've read it, let me know what you thought of it. Because I don't know that I have the emotional stamina to dive into something like that right now. It's a little too raw at the moment. Also, it has potential to be a little heavy-handed. I don't think this book would go the way of, say, The Boy in the Striped Pajamas, from everything I've heard about that book. But, you know, the potential's there. So, and I don't want to slander the book without having read it, but I, I just worry that it would end up being a lot and maybe a little obvious I don't know I'm reacting to this live so please you know bear with me I'm working through a lot of thoughts on the moment and maybe that's making me a little less articulate than I should be in the moment but I don't know about this one let me know what you think in the comment section down below if it's good it could be amazing so let me know if you've read it the next one is Salt Lick by Lulu Allison Britain is awash. The sea creeps into the land. Brambles and forests swamp derelict towns. Food production has moved overseas, and people are forced to move to the cities for work. The countryside is empty. A chorus. The herd of feral cows wander this newly wild land, watching over changing times, speaking with love and exasperation. Jesse and his puppy, Mr. Malix, roam the woods until his family are forced to leave for London. Lee runs from the terrible restrictions of the white town where he grew up. Isolde leaves London on foot walking the abandoned A12 in search of the truth about her mother. This is definitely something I'm going to need more feedback on. So if you've read it, let me know what you thought in the comment section down below. I might seek out some reviews, wait to see if it makes the shortlist, because it sounds like it could be really interesting. It doesn't immediately grab my attention the way some of the earlier books 
on the list did, and that kind of is what it is. The next one is Sorrow and Bliss by Meg Mason. Everyone tells Martha Friel she is clever and beautiful, a brilliant writer who has been loved every day of her adult life by one man, her husband Patrick, a gift her mother once said not everyone gets. So why is everything broken? Why is Martha on the edge of 40, friendless, practically jobless, and so often sad? And why did Patrick decide to leave? Maybe she is just too sensitive, someone who finds it harder to be alive than most people. Or maybe, as she has long believed, there is something wrong with her. Something that broke when a little bomb went off in her brain at 17 and left her changed in a way that no doctor or therapist has been able to explain. Forced to return to her childhood home to live with her dysfunctional bohemian parents, but without the help of her devoted foul-mouthed sister Ingrid, Martha has one last chance to find out whether a life is ever too broken to fix, or whether maybe by starting over she will get to write a better ending for herself. That's another one that sounds like it could be really great. It appeals to a lot of things that interest me and immediately grab my attention, but I am also going to say that some of the earlier books on the list grabbed my attention a little bit harder, so this is another one I'm going to be seeking out feedback for. So if you have any, please make it easy for me. <laughs> Leave it in the comments section down below. But I look forward to finding out more about this book from other people who have read it. It's another one that I was unfamiliar with. It's kind of a theme on this one. I am, however, familiar with the next book that made the long list, which is The Book of Form and Emptiness by Ruth O. Zeki. I saw this book when I was researching books that would be released in the latter half of 2021. And I really thought about adding it to my list of most anticipated books in the second half of the year, because I was a huge fan of Ruth Ozeki's previous book, which was A Tale for the Time Being. Love that book. And the premise of the Book of Form of Emptiness really made me pause. And I haven't gotten too much feedback on it since it was released. I've heard more people planning to read it than I have people actually reading it. So I don't know what to do with that quite. Let's do the description for you so you can kind of see what gave me pause about it. After the tragic death of his father, 14-year-old Benny O begins to hear voices. The voices belong to the things in his house and sound variously pleasant, angry, or sad. Then his mother develops a hoarding problem and the voices grow more clamorous. When ignoring them doesn't work, Benny seeks refuge in the silence of a large public library. There he meets a mesmerizing street artist with a smug pet ferret, a homeless philosopher poet who encourages him to find his own voice amongst the many, and his very own book, who narrates Benny's life and teaches him to listen to the things that truly matter. Blending unforgettable characters with everything from jazz to climate change to our attachment to material possessions, this is classic Ruth Ozeki, bold, humane, and heartbreaking. If anybody can pull that premise off, it's probably Ruth Ozeki, given my previous experience with her. But again, as we covered with a different book on the long list, anything to do with ghosts or voices kind of makes me pause. It's something that I don't usually react well to in a book, just knowing myself as a reader. I'm going to stay where I was before the long list was announced and just kind of let this be. If it makes the short list, if it ultimately ends up winning... I might consider reading The Book of Form and Emptiness, but I'm going to hold for now. But if you have thoughts about it, please feel free to try to change my mind in the comment section down below. The next one is The Bread the Devil Need by Lisa Allen Agostini. Alethea Lopez is about to turn 40. Fashionable, feisty, and fiercely independent, she manages a downtown boutique, but behind closed doors she's covering up bruises from her abusive partner and seeking solace in an affair with her boss. When she witnesses a woman murdered by a jealous lover, the reality of her own future comes a little too close to home. Bringing us her truth in an arresting, unsparing Trinidadian voice, Alethea unravels memories repressed since childhood and begins to understand the person she has become. Her next step is to decide the woman she wants to be. That sounds really good. Painful, obviously, but that sounds really good. I'm going to leave this tab open because I feel like that is something that I would like to seek out and give a try for myself, for sure. The next book is The Exhibitionist by Charlotte Mendelssohn, which has a fun cover. Meet the Hanrahan family, gathering for a momentous weekend as famous artist and notorious egoist Ray Hanrahan prepares for a new ex exhibition of his art, the first in many decades, and one he is sure will burnish his reputation for good. 
His three children will be there, beautiful Leah, always her father's biggest champion, sensitive Patrick, who has finally decided to strike out on his own, and insecure Jess, the youngest, who has her own momentous decision to make. And what of Lucia, Ray's steadfast and selfless wife? She is an artist too, but has always put her roles as wife and mother first. What will happen if she decides to change? For Lucia is hiding secrets of her own, and as the weekend unfolds and the exhibition approaches, she must finally make a choice. I am going to leave this tab open. This was another one I wasn't familiar with. Because it sounds interesting enough, but it also sounds a little familiar if you've read The Wife by Meg Wolitzer or The Woman Upstairs by Claire Messud. Even novels about families that have been a little bit estranged coming back together, that has been done a lot. So it sounds really interesting to me, but it also sounds very familiar in ways that might not help the book. So I'm interested, but I do have a little bit of hesitation about it. But I am going to leave this tab open so I can see if it, if and where it is available. The next one is the first book I actually own. It's the final revival of Opal and Nev by Donnie Walton. This was one of my most anticipated books from last year. It was one of my favorite books from last year. So I'm not all that surprised to see it here, except I am a little bit surprised because it felt like this was a book that had been very overlooked last year. So I'm happy that it is getting a spotlight and that it is getting a lot of attention and maybe this will draw more people to it. I'll do the description that they wrote for it. Opal is a fiercely independent young woman pushing against the grain in her style and attitude, a black punk artist before her time. Despite her unconventional looks, Opal believes she can be a star. So when the aspiring British singer-songwriter Neville Charles discovers her one night, she takes him up on his offer to make rock music together. In early 70s New York City, just as she's finding her niche as part of a flamboyant and funky creative scene, a rival band signed to her label brandishes a Confederate flag at a promotional concert. Opal's bold protest and the violence that ensues set off a chain of events that will not only change the lives of those she loves, but also be a deadly reminder that repercussions are always harsher for women, especially black women, who dare to speak their truth. And that is, that last part right there is why I really like this book, because it's about how certain people are held accountable at a much higher rate than other people. And it kind of grapples with whether or not that's fair. I thought that was really interesting. It is told in oral history format, which is a kind of tricky concept for a book, but one that I am continually fascinated with. The person editing the collection uh, had had a father who was killed in the riot that the plot description speaks. And that's not a spoiler. It's the opening of the book talks about that. And Opal had been having an affair with her father. So that's sort of a complication that is dealt with throughout the book as well. I would recommend it. I think there are some flaws. I admit I won't be surprised if this does not make the shortlist, but I am really happy that this book is getting more attention and hopefully it will put this book in more hands of more people and they will discover this book as well because I really found a lot of it interesting and enjoyed it. So for whatever that's worth, that is the final revival of Opal and Nev. The next one is The Island of Missing Trees by Elif Shafak. This is a book I had heard of, but I actually don't really know the premise of. I had held off on looking into it because I still need to read Elif Shafak's last book, which was 10 minutes and 38 seconds in this strange world, something like that. It was a shortlisted title for the Booker Prize maybe two years ago, and I really want to read that book. So I'm not going to be surprised if this sounds like something I would really like to pick up. It is 1974 on the island of Cyprus. Two teenagers from opposite sides of a divided land meet at a tavern in the city they both call home. The tavern is the only place that Costas, who is Greek and Christian, and Daphne, who is Turkish and Muslim, can meet in secret, hidden beneath the blackened beams from which hang garlands of garlic, chili peppers, and wild herbs. This is where they can find the best food in town, the best music, the best wine. But there is something else to the place. It makes one forget, even if just for a few hours, the world outside and its immoderate sorrows. In the center of the tavern, growing through a cavity in the roof, is a fig tree. This tree will witness their hushed, happy meetings, their silent, surreptitious departures, and the tree will be there when the war breaks out, when the capital is reduced to rubble, when the teenagers vanish and break apart. Decades later in North London, 16-year-old Ada Kazantzakis has never visited the island where her parents were born. Desperate for answers, she seeks to untangle years of secrets 
separation, and silence. The only connection she has to the land of her ancestors is a ficus carica growing in the back garden of their home. And sure enough, that sounds really interesting. I will not at all be surprised if this ends up making the shortlist. I haven't heard too much about it yet. I, I don't think, at least in the United States, this has been released all that recently. So I haven't heard too much feedback on it yet, but it sounds really interesting. I think based on Elif Shavak's history with the Booker Prize, and I, I believe she's been nominated for the Women's Prize before, possibly. Could be wrong about that. Um, I won't be surprised at all if this ends up making the shortlist. And I'm going to leave this tab open to go to the next one, The Paper Palace by Miranda Cowley Heller. On a perfect August morning, Elle Bishop heads out for a swim in the pond below the Paper Palace, her family's holiday home in Cape Cod. As she dives beneath the water, she relives the passionate encounter she had the night before against the side of the house that knows all her darkest secrets while her husband and mother chatted to their guests inside. So begins a story that unfolds over 24 hours and 50 years, as Elle's shocking betrayal leads her to a life-changing decision and an ending you won't be able to stop thinking about. Something that sounds a little familiar, actually. Oh, uh, this was a Reese's Book Club pick, so that's probably where I heard this before. It does sound really interesting, so I'm going to leave this tab open. If you have feedback on the Paper Palace, please let me know in the comment section down below. I didn't place the title or the author, but the premise started to sound a little familiar. And that does sound interesting. So I'll be checking this one out. We're coming to the end. This is one that I am very familiar with. It's The Sentence by Louise Erdrich. I am a fan of Louise Erdrich. I've been kind of all over the map. I've had books of hers that I've really loved, books that I thought were, you know, good. And uh, there has been one book that I kind of didn't like. And we'll leave it at that. This one is her latest novel, and it asks what we owe to the living, the dead, to the reader, and to the book. A small independent bookstore in Minneapolis is haunted from November 2019 to November 2020 by the store's most annoying customer. Flora dies on All Souls Day, but she simply won't leave the store. Tuki, who has landed a job selling books after years of incarceration that she survived by reading with murderous attention, must solve the mystery of this haunting while at the same time trying to understand all that occurs in Minneapolis during a year of grief, astonishment, isolation, and furious reckoning. The sentence begins on All Souls Day 2019 and ends on All Souls Day 2020. Its mystery and proliferating ghost stories during this one year propel a narrative as rich, emotional, and profound as anything Louise Erdrich has written. Now, I've mentioned for at least two other books, that ghost stories always give me pause. But Louise Erdrich is an author that I will always give the benefit of the doubt on that because ghosts, spirits are sort of a through line through her works. And I trust the way she will handle it. She, of course, comes from with a Native American background and always has that perspective in it. I'm not surprised to see an inclusion of... Um, someone with years of incarceration because that's another through line in her stories and I I knew it was there I'm not I shouldn't say it was of course I'm not surprised that it's there and Louise Erdrich by the way owns a bookstore in Minneapolis that I have visited it's called Birch Bark Books if you are ever in the Minneapolis area check it out it's a really fun store so this is something I'm definitely interested in I had actually gotten this from the library as well just like Great Circle and didn't have time to read it so I ended up sending it back to the library and getting back on the wait list and I would definitely like to read it. Potentially a strong contender for the shortlist, but I feel like because Louisa Erdrich is so known, and because I have heard good feedback about the book, I wouldn't be surprised if it gets nudged out by some of the lesser known authors and books on this list, but it seems like it could be a strong contender. Now let's get to the last one, One Sky Day by Leon Ross. Dawn breaks across the archipelago of Papisho. The world is stirring awake again, each resident with their own list of things to do. A wedding feast to conjure and cook, an infidelity to investigate, a lost soul to set free. As the sun rises, two star-crossed lovers try to find their way back to one another across this single day. When night falls, all have been given a gift, and many are no longer the same. The sky is pink, and some wonder if it will ever be blue again. That sounds interesting, but it also doesn't give a whole lot of in-depth explanation of what this book is. So I'm going to leave this tab open because I'm, I am intrigued enough to look further to try to see more about it. And again, as always, if you have feedback about it, please let me know in the comment section down below. So those are the 16 books that made the long list. So the ones that I left open were Build Your House Around My Body by Violet Cooper Smith, 
Careless by Kirsty Capes, Flamingo by Rachel Elliott, and that one is kind of a maybe. Uh, the Bread the Devil Need by Lisa Allen Agostini, The Exhibitionist by Charlotte Mendelssohn, The Island of Missing Trees by Elif Shafak, The Paper Palace by Miranda Cowley Heller, and this one, Sky Day by Leon Ross. And I am also very interested in reading the Great Circle by Maggie Ship said I didn't leave that tab open because I already know <laughs> about that book and I already know that I want to read it. And the same goes for The Sentence by Louise Erdrich. Not really going to predict what's going to make the shortlist. I've already talked a little bit about what kind of has good chances. Um, but I'd love to hear what you think might make the shortlist out of this. Please let me know in the comment section down below. In terms of omissions, I am very surprised The Love Songs of W.E.B. Du Bois by Honoré Fanon Jeffers did not make the list. I... Didn't even make a prediction video for this, but that is the one book that immediately jumped into my head like, okay, that'll probably make the list, and it's not here, and that does surprise me. It's been such a well-received book, at least in the United States. Maybe it didn't quite have such a splash overseas. Maybe it hasn't even been published in the UK yet. That's a possibility. I don't know. I don't have the facts on that, but it certainly has made a splash here in the United States to the point where I really thought it had a shot at making this list, and it, it didn't. So the other ones are Beautiful World, Where Are You? by Sally Rooney, which is, of course, a popular author in the UK and here in the United States, and that was a very popular book as well. I haven't read it because I've only read Conversations with Friends, and I kind of had mixed results on that one. But it is a little surprising that it didn't at least make the long list. It's, I mean, Sally Rooney is a very established author, and some debut novelists crept in, and that, that seems surprising, but it is kind of exciting. So, and as somebody who's not quite a fan of Sally Rooney, I kind of like the list as it is. And the same goes with To Paradise by Hanya Yanagihara. I wasn't sure if this would even be eligible since it was published in January, but I guess it might be, because I, I did look at one article, I think, from The Guardian to see what they had. They noted that this did not make the list. So I'm guessing it probably was eligible for this year, but I can't say for certain. And I have very mixed history with Hanya Yanagihara. I liked the people in the trees, and I hated A Little Life. I'm one of those people. So I have no interest in reading To Paradise, but I know a lot of people are fans. And that's fine. I'm not trying to you know, pee in your pool or anything like that. You're allowed to enjoy it. That's fine. For you, I am surprised that she did not make the long list. And for me, I have enjoyed exploring the books that did. I would love to hear what you think of the long list for the 2022 Women's Prize. What you are surprised didn't make it. What you are rooting for. What you discovered off of this list that you will be reading. Let me know all of that in the comment section down below. As always, I really appreciate your time. And I will be back. Until next time, happy reading.